It's an oft-heard refrain from Republicans looking to discredit the Ukraine coal whistleblower. The claim was based on secondhand information. But now another whistleblower has gone to the intelligence community's inspector general, reportedly with first-hand knowledge of the incident. It's also said to be a member of the intelligence community. Once again, the White House is painting this all as much ado about nothing, with Press Secretary Stephanie Grisham saying in a statement yesterday, doesn't matter how many people decide to call themselves whistleblowers about the same telephone call, a call the president already made public, doesn't change the fact that he has done nothing wrong. Of course, Democrats leading the impeachment investigation still have plenty of questions and are negotiating to meet with both whistleblowers. Last week, the former special envoy to Ukraine, Kurt Volker, testified in closed-door hearings and handed over a series of text messages that appear to confirm that Trump was pressuring the president of Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden's son. In one text, Volker told a senior Ukrainian aide, heard from the White House, assuming President Z convinces Trump he will investigate, get to the bottom of what happened in 2016, we will nail down date for visit to Washington. But just what that proves depends on who you ask. I consider these documents smoking guns. I've said that many times, and it just keeps getting worse. Remember Kavanaugh. Mm. Remember Kavanaugh. It started with one complaint that wound up being unverifiable. This is Kavanaugh all over again. So will this be a turning point? Will there ever be a turning point? I'm joined by Michael Curry, former president of the Boston NAACP, now chair of the National NAACP Advocacy and Policy Committee. Michael, good to see you. Good to see you, Mike Astro is former associate counsel to George H.W. Bush and Ronald Reagan, former commissioner of Social Security for George W. Bush and Barack Obama. Long time, Mike. It's good to see you as well. So can we start with when do you think the impeachment hearings for Mitt Romney will begin. <laughs> have any idea? Okay, so here is Colin Powell uh, I th last Tuesday, but aired yesterday on CNN. Here's General Powell. The Republican Party has got to get a grip on itself. Right now, the Republican leaders and members of the Congress, both Senate and the House, are holding back because they're terrified of what will happen to any one of them if they speak out. Will they lose a primary? You agree with Powell, Mike Astro? I think there's a lot of hesitation for uh, a lot of senators who might like to speak up but aren't because they're afraid of the consequences. I agree with that. You've been in those cloakrooms. What are they saying in those cloakrooms, do you think? I, you know, when you add up the numbers and you say what percentage of the Republicans have been the target of extremely harsh critical comment from the president, it's a pretty high percentage. And if there's one thing that's true for senators, Republican or Democrat, is they don't forget those things and they look for an opportunity to retaliate. So for the Democrats, that's really, I think, one of the big opportunities, that this is a potential wedge and that the personal support is very shallow, as you're suggesting. A lot of it is about the consequences. And so the reason the president uh, proposed the impeachment of Mitt Romney was because Mitt Romney made a critical comment. Uh, so did Susan Collins, to a degree, from Maine. So did Ben Sass, three Republican senators out of Nebraska. None have said there should be an impeachment inquiry. They haven't gone into that, but just say they're troubled. By it. Is there a tipping point here, or was Trump right? I could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and get away with it. I think we've all been shocked by how much he can get away with, and uh, shooting someone on Fifth Avenue might be one of them. Um, I think even if you looked at Romney's comment or Collins and others who've been critical of him, they've been cautiously critical of him. Um, we are at a, a, a perilous time in our political system. I think uh, this whole notion that we had co congressional oversight and that this president can be checked by, um, by Congress is uh, uh, in question right now. Do, is there a point at which, I mean, it, it, whether it's a critical mass of Republicans en masse do this, are we going to see it, or is this going to be a straight Democratic vote for impeachment of the House at the end of hearings and a straight Republican motion to dismiss vote when it gets to the Senate and they have to have a trial? Is that what we're going to see? We might. Um, there is some history of impeachments being extremely partisan. Um, I think the Senate, I mean, the House scenario you suggest is pretty probable. I think the Senate is more unpredictable. A lot can happen between then and now. I think part of the problem with projecting now is there's this sense is, okay, we, we have the smoking gun, this, everything's mm -hmm. gonna happen quickly. That's not gonna happen. We're really only in the second inning on this, which concerns a lot of people because I think they already have fatigue you know, on, the, on these issues. But I think the story's gonna take a long time to unfold. There's six separate committees investigating different things. The legal theory 
is not clear. The facts that are necessary to support that aren't clear. The ones, the facts. Well, what's that, unclear about the legal theory that it's illegal to solicit campaign something of value for your campaign from a foreign leader? And Donald Trump, as Stephanie Grisham has said, has acknowledged it in plain view in his own words. Not to mention the memo on the the call. Well, then you've you've got factual issues whether you tie that to specifically for the campaign or just personal vindictiveness. So, and there's a question, you know, if the president legitimately believes somebody committed a crime, um, asking for assistance, particularly. And at least on a couple of the transcripts, it looks like he largely was just trying to flip it to his lawyers. It's going to be messy, and it's going to involve state of mind. It's going to involve a lot of different factual. I think it's going to be a long, slow slog. And I think ultimately the Democrats have not focused yet on exactly how they're going to try to bring this home. Could quickly, do you agree with that? Um, I think it could be. I think it, it's all about strategy, right? I think ultimately they need to r reveal as much as they could and can uh, around what happened here with Ukraine. And I think there's more coming. So I think, uh, as uh, Speaker Pelosi has said, they need to move swiftly, uh, quickly to to bring this impeachment. And while it's going on, they're essentially the Democratic race for the nomination has almost disappeared, with the exception of Bernie Sanders having health problems. Here he is, I believe this is from him leaving a Las Vegas hospital. Here's Sanders. Hello, everybody. We're in Las Vegas. I just got out of the hospital a few hours ago, and I'm feeling so much better. I just want to thank all of you for the love and warm wishes uh, that you sent to me. Uh, see you soon on the campaign trail. Originally, they disclosed the stent in the clogged artery. A few days later, it was the first time we heard about a heart attack. We don't know how severe a heart attack. The Washington Post suggests, not in an editorial, but in a, in a story today, that the trickle-down impact of a 78-year-old with health problems on the Democratic side may trickle down to a 76-year-old Biden, who had aneurysm issues several decades ago, and a healthy 70-year-old, another septuagenarian, Elizabeth Warren, the three most popular Democrats, all in their 70s. Mm -hmm. Is that realistic? It is. I think there's a conversation to be had about the, the health of our candidates for president. I and think the age of our and candidates. And the age and the health. And, and usually they could go together. Um, I think in uh, Bernie Sanders' case, and very close to many of his campaign folks, uh, it is a concern. I've been texting them to say, hey, I hope he's fine. But it, if you are a voter, it should be something you can you consider. You you have spent a decent amount of your life in the healthcare industry. Well, in old age too. <laughs> so so it, does it not drive you nuts that the voters don't know more about what the health situation is about one of the front runners, or at least top of the second tier candidates? But yeah. he said, doesn't he owe the American people a report on his health? We we have a long, don't they all? By the way, we have a long history of presidents obscuring their health issues, and that's, that's bad. Um, I think that the fact that Senator Sanders had um, a heart attack is problematic for a lot of voters, but I think for a lot of voters too, the fact that he didn't come clean about it. I mean, I'm sitting there saying, look, you have chest pain so bad that you go to the hospital, you have two stents put in, that's a heart attack. And they spent, I think, three days refusing to acknowledge that it was a heart attack. And so I think there's the underlying issue, but I think it's also, you know, the, the public is, is clamoring for candor and the fact that he couldn't be straight about the heart attack. I think that's going to bother people, too. Yeah, and, you know, it, it, maybe this is not time for this, but since I'm sort of obsessed with it, there used to be a well, time, then it's time. There used to be a time when uh, the candidates for the major major parties would submit their health records right. to right. a reporter at the New York Times, and I can't remember his name. He'd report yeah. on uh, uh, these things. Uh, we don't have health records on any of the three leading candidates. They right. say they're going to disclose them, I guess, before primary season starts. The public's entitled to that on all the major candidates, isn't it? Well, I think I think what we've seen in the last several years or many years was the basically the statement of the doctor, the primary care physician, saying that the person was in good well, health. Well, like Ronnie Jackson. I mean, it's like a Saturday Night Live routine with, <laughs> exactly. uh, with uh, President Trump. Exactly. So I think we're at a place where even, even from a confidential, and I work in the healthcare space, people don't want to reveal all of their health care uh, issues because uh, they might not bar you from being president, but they want a, a clean bill of health, at least, or some statement from your primary care that you could serve in that capacity. Very quickly, is age going to be, I mean, obviously it helps the Democrats that the guy they're running against is 73 years old and totally out of shape, despite what mm. Ronnie Jackson has to say. Will, will age be an issue? We only have 15 seconds on the Democratic side before it's over. I think it's quite possible. I mean, I personally think that we're very close to Senator Warren wrapping up the nomination. I mean, I think that... 
Uh, the Democratic front runner traditionally slides and collapses, and Biden's filling that role. Sanders has been losing slowly to Biden, I mean, to Warren yeah. for a while. And I think the heart attack issue is going to accelerate that. Warren, the most energetic 70 year old people have ever seen. Mike Astrid, it's great <laughs> to see you again. Michael, thank you thank so much. You. Appreciate your time, gentlemen.